Leon Chen here, where my mission is to increase your wealth, health, and happiness. On April 16th, there were some really promising headlines that a new drug called Remdesivir could potentially have some really good results in treating COVID-19. As a result, their manufacturer's stock surged 8%, taking along the rest of the market with it in additional 800 points on the Dow in after hours trading. Then on April 21st, there was some leaked data that showed that it may have caused a little bit more harm than good. Then all of a sudden, the stock also crashed back down and again, taking along the rest of the market with it. You know, I feel like I'm on an emotional roller coaster just being pulled in every which way. The purpose of today's video is to separate out fact from fiction, give you the raw data, and also help you to be an intelligent investor in navigating these times. Even if you're not an investor, this might be able to give you an idea on whether or not this could be a potential treatment for COVID-19 because, hey, if we can treat it, we might not have to be quarantined. And then all these fears about a second resurgence in COVID-19 could be quelled and everyone could go back to work. Just remember that while I am a medical doctor, a lot of the information I have is preliminary and not peer reviewed. So having said that, just take me as just a random guy on YouTube giving his opinion. First, let's talk about how the body works. Then we'll talk about how viruses work. Then we'll talk about how antivirals like remdesivir works. Then we will look at some articles, the headlines, and also look at some actual raw data. Welcome to the cell. This is where all the good stuff happens in medicine. This is the nucleus, and we're gonna zoom in on this section right here. Okay, we have the cell here, and in the nucleus, we have something called DNA. DNA is the building block, or the, the blueprints and the building blocks of our body that has all the genetic code, and it tells, it basically has everything written uh, about us in there. And then you have something here, he's called polymerase, he's a polymerase, and he will create something called RNA. He basically unwinds the DNA and then as he starts reading it, then he starts moving, he starts creating this RNA strand that comes out. This RNA strand will come out into the cytoplasm. The reason why the body does this is because DNA can't move from the nucleus. It's very highly protected and so they, all you can do is just create a copy and then move it out uh, to work with it. So then RNA is out here in the cytoplasm and then you have something called a ribosome, ribosome, and it basically looks like a top-heavy hamburger, and the ribosome will read the RNA, and it will create a protein, which is something that you're probably familiar with, protein, and these proteins will do whatever uh, it was designed to do according to the DNA that was copied from the part of the DNA code that was copied from So whether it's it has functions inside the cell or if it was designed to leave the cell and do other stuff This is essentially how the body uh, Works um, in building kind of the basic building blocks of the of the body and protein and how a lot of cells function now Let's say that we have a virus And he has these little spikes on him because that's just the way he was made. And what do these spikes kind of look like? They kind of look like the sun or they kind of look like a crown. Another word for that is corona. And as you might have known, coronavirus. And so he actually has his own RNA in here. And then he... Someone, sneeze, someone who had COVID-19 sneezed on you or sneezed on someone and then the virus got into your lungs when you breathed it in. And so this, let's say the cell is a lung cell. Now, this virus is like, all right, now's my chance. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to merge on here. Really what happens is this spiky thing. Uh, the cell has a receptor here and then it kind of binds on there. And it's like a key. It says, hey, let me in. And then he gets let in. So this guy actually ends up looking like that. And all of his viral RNA kind of sneaks in here. It's just hanging out over here. Now there's also something called, there's another 
polymerase, polymerase. And what is he reading? He's reading RNA, so this is called RNA polymerase, as opposed to the one in the nucleus, this is called DNA polymerase. So what this RNA polymerase does is it really amplifies what it reads. It's like, hey, I read this stuff. Now let's really make a bunch of it. We're just gonna 10X it, right? So he makes a bunch of it. These viral proteins sneak in here, and then now the proteins that are being made are actually now viral proteins, and all these proteins are viral. Eventually, they'll come again, and then they start making more viruses all these proteins with their own RNA in there and then they keep making these coronaviruses until eventually the cell explodes and uh, these guys are free to infect other cells okay now you might have heard of a manufacturer called Gilead Gilead Sciences and they made a drug called remdesivir. Remdesivir. This is an antiviral. Antiviral. I think it was either made for hepatitis or for Ebola, uh, but it was originally designed for that. But then, and then they did clinical trials, and they thought it was safe. So they thought, hey, why not? Why don't we go ahead and try that on people who have COVID nineteen, and see what it does? Really, th theoretically, this drug would attack this guy and then it would that's how it would prevent all these viruses from uh, forming or at least to try to help uh, treat the patients uh, by using this drug. On April 16th, Stat News published a headline that patients in the hospital were rapidly improving after being treated with remdesivir. They had 125 patients enlisted. This was performed at the University of Chicago of Medicine. 113 had, and I quote, severe disease. They were given daily remdesivir. Only two of those patients, I quote, perished. There was no control that I could see. To me, this sounds like a retrospective cohort study. What is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. In medicine, we have different levels in a hierarchy of evidence. That means that some forms of evidence are more meaningful than others. You might know someone that might have said, it must be true, I see it all the time. Is that the same level of evidence as if instead of that, we had some scientists pull out a group of people and maybe hundreds of people, and then they mix them together so that they're all random, then they assign them into two groups. They have a treatment arm, and then they have a control arm, and then they follow them. The treatment gets the medicine, the control gets either a placebo or nothing, and then they follow and see if there's any differences and they control for any sort of confounding factors, which seems to be more reliable the person who said they saw it with their own eyes or the scientific study. The second one is called a randomized controlled trial, which is essentially the gold standard in evidence. The other one we probably equate more to like something on the level of a case study. Then if the randomized controlled trial gets analyzed and filtered, it can be even higher level of evidence such as a meta-analysis. This particular study sounds like a cohort study because I didn't see a placebo. Then on April 20th, there was a headline that promoted this drug even more, and it seemed to be a randomized controlled trial. Unfortunately, it was on monkeys and not on humans. But I do have the data here, so right here. So instead of blindly listening to a guy on YouTube, why don't we analyze it together and you can see it with your own eyes. Come on, come closer, don't be shy, you can come on. Okay, so let's look at this article together. In front of me, I have the article from Gilead Sciences where they performed a study on remdesivir uh, in an animal study with 12 macaques. So let's look at this. We have, uh, here's remdesivir, and they had two groups of six rhesus macaques. They were given coronavirus. Don't get confused, that's the uh, official name for coronavirus. This means uh, infected with. 12 hours post-inoculation, one group was administered the remdesivir, and the other group was treated with a basically placebo. And it was given basically on a daily basis. So let's write that out. We got six, and six of them received remdesivir, and then six received placebo. 
we'll call the ones that got the remdesivir as the treatment arm. And then the six that received the placebo as the control arm. I don't know why they call it a control arm or a treatment arm, just go with it. Okay. Now they say after inoculation with that, they were assigned a daily clinical score based on a pre-established scoring sheet in a blinded fashion, meaning that a researcher did a physical exam on the macaques daily and he was blinded as to whether or not the macaques received either the treatment or the placebo. Okay, and then they showed only one of the six treatment arm showed mild dyspnea. That word means shortness of breath. I'll just write that right here, shortness of breath. Tachypnea means elevated respiratory rate. So they had only one out of six in the treatment arm showed short of breath. And then they showed as opposed to all inside the control. So that's six out of six. It had short of breath and also increased respiratory rate. This means an x-ray. Uh, and it sounds like they did a chest x-ray daily and they showed significantly less lung lobe involvement and less pulmonary infiltration, meaning signs of uh, infection in the lungs. So bonus points to the treatment arm. They were euthanized on the seventh day. DPI means days post inoculation. They collected tissue samples from each lung to compare the level of virus replication in both the treatment and vehicle, uh, treatment and the placebo arms so they said 10 out of 36 samples, the viral RNA could not be detected. That's another way of saying 26, uh, it was detected in. We'll just write it that way. Detected virus. Whereas this was the case in only 30, yeah, 36. This is another way of saying 33, it was detected. I'm just converting it to make it easier to read when we kind of analyze all of it together so that they're all uh, saying levels of symptoms or levels of virus rather than kind of switching back and forth and making it confusing. Okay, then they said viral load was significantly lower in the lungs from the remdesivir animals than the vehicle treated vehicles. Virus could be isolated from lung lobes of five out of six control animals, but none of the tissues collected from the remdesivir animals was positive in isolation. So we'll say zero out of six, and then we'll say five out of six. This is viral load. Then they observed visually Gross lung lesions were observed in one out of six remdesivir treated animals. In contrast, all six controls had visible lung lesions. So six out of six of the control and only one out of six on a visual examination as opposed to a histological meaning through a microscope. They were absent in three of the six remdesivir treatment animals, meaning that there was three of the six that had it because six minus three is three. So this is histologic as opposed to this one up here, which is gross. As opposed to five out of six in the control arm, they also did note that of the ones that were in the treatment arm, they were actually mild. Where does it say that? It's right, developed minimal pulmonary pathology. Right here. Minimal. Then we go down to the discussion over here where they kind of just talk about what all this means. 
they're really cheering the potential for this. But they did also acknowledge that the administration of the dose was very close to the peak of the viral replication, meaning that they were infected with the virus and then it was only after 12 hours after they knew they gave the monkeys the virus and then they gave the antiviral. But if you think about it in real life, that's not usually how it happens. Usually what happens is that someone gets infected and then they don't even know they have anything's going on. They're completely asymptomatic and then they walk around living out their life and then it's not until they start feeling really sick with a fever, a cough, you know, all these symptoms, then they end up going to the hospital. And then when the, then by the time that the physicians diagnose them, then they give them the medication. That could be many, many days after that, um, definitely not 12 hours. Uh, but you'll kind of wonder, well, why is that? Well, if you look back into our other diagram, the way that remdesivir works is that it actually attacks the RNA polymerase so to prevent the viruses from replicating. But if you think about it, by the time you have all of those symptoms, you're, the viruses have probably already replicated and attacking that RNA polymerase at this point probably wouldn't help very much. I wanna add just one more part is that in every study you always want to look at this. Not necessarily a bad thing, but you do wanna just make sure you're fully aware. Then on April 23rd, there was a leaked study from China that was a randomized controlled trial. It sounded like it caused more harm than good. And then all of a sudden, Gilead stock dropped and along the rest of the stock market went with it. The details of that showed that there were 237 patients, 158 received the drug, 79 received the placebo. After a month, 13.9% of the patients taking remdesivir had died compared to 12.8% of those receiving the placebo. The trial was stopped early due to side effects. Gilead had responded at their website, this study was terminated early due to low enrollment and as a result, it was underpowered to enable statistically meaningful outcomes. While they terminated the study early, they do still see a potential benefit of the treatment. Now, some of you watching this is gonna think to yourself, well, I do know statistics and statistical power is related to your sample size. The sample size in this study was 237. And then the other study at the University of Chicago Medicine was 125. Isn't 237 higher than 125? It is. The other thing to consider is that there probably is a good likelihood of benefit if you start the medication within 12 hours of getting the infection. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem like a real world scenario, right? Didn't Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's basically leading the war against this, say that you could have no symptoms up to two weeks? It also makes me think in the University of Chicago Medicine study that 117 of those patients were, remember, quote, severe. To me, severe sounds like somebody who's in the ICU or on a ventilator, or if not even that, maybe even has a fever. I would imagine that by the time you get those symptoms, it's probably way longer than 12 hours. So if they did have benefit, then maybe it could still be beneficial after, if you get it after 12 hours. All of this paints a very confusing picture, but I hope that after our discussion today, you feel a little bit more comfortable with the headlines and not just get jerked around by them. All right, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, comment, share. All of this helps me out and encourages me to make more videos like this. Comment if you like seeing more of this type of video. I'd be happy to make more of these. Thanks and see you soon.